Thank you for joining us for this second community conversation on housing in Chautauqua County. I'm WRFA Public Affairs Director Julia Cecil Hanley. Maslow's hierarchy of needs has shelter as the first basic need, along with food, sleep, and access to fresh water. The importance of housing to an individual and for communities is why we're continuing this discussion on housing in Jamestown and Chautauqua County for this month's community conversation. In the last episode, we discussed issues such as how lead is present in a lot of our area's housing and how that can be dealt with, homelessness, and other resources available for those dealing with finding housing and maintaining housing. This episode, we'll dive deeper into issues facing housing in the city of Jamestown, as well as programs that have been developed in the city to address those issues, as well as discussions about how the Land Bank program is part of efforts with housing across Chautauqua County. While we don't have an in-person audience at this event, those watching online are invited to submit answers to our panel using the comments section on either Facebook or YouTube, if time allows, I will then ask them those questions. Please keep your questions brief. Also, this program is made possible through funding by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's American Rescue Plan Act Stabilization Grant Fund. And so now we will introduce you to our panel tonight. And to the far right of myself, we have Gina Paradis, who is the Executive Director for the Chautauqua County Land Bank Corporation. And then to my immediate right, we have Crystal Sertic, who is the Director of Development for the City of Jamestown. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. So Gina, we are going to start with you. We've mentioned uh, the Land Bank in our com in opening comments, and uh, I thought it would be good to kind of get an overview of what, what does the Land Bank do? Uh, well, the land bank is um, designated by the state of New York as a nonprofit slash public authority hybrid. So we're a little bit different type of organization uh, than, than some people are used to. But what it allows us to do is, uh, is be created by the county. We are created through the county, designated by the state, so that we can act uh, with some public authority powers to help communities deal with issues of blight and vacancy um, or blight caused by vacancy, uh, as some would have it. So we're a small organization. Uh, we operate primarily as a nonprofit. We are not part of the county, um, but we do get funds uh, through various public and private um, funding resources to deal with issues of vacancy and the blight that's caused by primarily foreclosures, bank foreclosures, tax foreclosures, um, and those issues of blight that are basically from disinvestment um, and out migration when people leave and the population goes down. And uh, you know, our area of the state has very, very old housing stock. And uh, through years of population outgrowth, and, uh, and just changes in how our society lives, you know, we end up with a lot of housing stock that's um, out, outdated, in poor condition, and a lot of times eventually vacated and, and left. Um, so our land bank operates to help communities deal with those types of issues, uh, primarily through a uh, rehab housing program, our sales for rehab, um, through demolition, in which we get grant funding to help communities demolish old derelict buildings that they n don't necessarily have the funding to do. Um, and we have a side lot program that helps uh, put vacant lots back on the tax rolls and put them back into productive use. Um, so those are our three main programs. We've also added to that program recently with our hands-on neighborhoods program. Uh, which uh, you may have heard about. And that is going to be more neighborhood focused. And we've got several components to that program, including the cleanup events that are probably most familiar in the James Count community. But we also have a couple other components that we're developing. One is gonna be a first time home buyer mentoring program. And uh, the SEPTED program, which stands for Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, uh, which is a partnership between the land bank and um, the county and the city with law enforcement officers that we're certifying through that program to help with neighborhood safety issues. Um, and uh, we also have a mobile tool trailer, 
that will be used as part of that programming as well. Mm -hmm. And you serve <coughs> all of Chautauqua County, right? Yes. Okay, so that, that's something I want to make clear because while Crystal Sirk is here for representing the city of Jamestown, mm -hmm. your agency organization serves all of Chautauqua County. Yes. And I want to ask, I, I'm aware of projects that you've been, done and you know things that you've worked with with the county on, but what are some of the things that you've done here in Jamestown with housing recently? I think overall the, the sales for rehab program is probably the most visible um, impacts that we've had in the community. Although demolition, we've done a ton of demolition in Jamestown. Um, and part of that is simply because there was such a glut of substandard housing that we didn't have the resources to handle over the years. Um, so we, we really set aside a lot of funding uh, to deal with demolition issues and worked with the city to basically double what they were capable of doing with their funding by adding our grant funding to the mix and helping with that. Uh, the sales for rehab program is a little bit more visible in the neighborhoods from the standpoint of watching a house transform from being a derelict structure and maybe you know, the worst house on the block to maybe the best house on the block, um, or at very least back up to standard with the rest of the, uh, of the neighborhood. And that's really where we've tried to focus the efforts of that program uh, is in the stabilization of neighborhoods where we can make the most impacts uh, because a lot of times we are just doing one house on the block because that's all we have access to. So we want to do that in an area that strategically is going to make a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. Do you have like, do you list those properties on your website or how do people mm -hmm. like access that information? Yeah, primarily on our website. Um, Early on, we did some uh, ads in the real estate booklets and things like that, very expensive. Um, so once we got our website up to speed, that's the primary place where we market our properties. Um, but we do have uh, them listed in the MLS, the multiple listing service, so that realtors have access and people can actually see them online. They will pop up if they're doing a search. And, um, and we worked it out so that we have a flat commission that we pay real estate agents who show our homes and that leads to a sale. Uh, but primarily the marketing is done through our website, um, in which case we try to put as much information about the home in there as we can because we do do assessments of our homes when we get them and appraisals. And then we try to include that information so that people know what they're dealing with. Uh, which is one of the benefits of buying from the land bank versus the auction. Mm -hmm. And um, what, is, what is the address for the website? The, the website is at um, chqlandbank.org. All right, that's easy enough. Um, I want to, because I know that sometimes properties, you find properties sometimes through the tax auction. Is that mm -hmm. an accurate statement? Primarily. Primarily. Yes. And, we just had a tax auction, yes. finally, in Chautauqua <laughs> County in July, and uh, it was delayed because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. I think there was it was the first one they had done in three years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how does how does something like that kind of delay, due to in a very extraordinary circumstance, affect what you're doing and affect housing in general? Um. It certainly affected our program because we had no inventory <laughs> during that whole period, unfortunately. Um, but you know, there's there were certainly benefits and disadvantages mm -hmm. to not having uh, the auction over the course of, of that time. Um, you know, certainly it hurt the county, it hurt the tax base, it hurt mm -hmm. a lot of uh, people who otherwise would have been putting some money into um, those houses that were vacant already. We couldn't get access to those houses, so they further deteriorated. Um, however, if you look at some of the national statistics, uh, child poverty went down for the first time in years and years because there was a moratorium on evictions. Um, so there's little, there's little bright spots in the fact mm -hmm that you know we did have those types of impacts but certainly having the moratorium you know really really did uh, hurt the housing stock from the standpoint of disinvestment mm -hmm. and when you mentioned that our housing stock is already old and already yes. has 
structure issues or whatever, you know, just condition issues that, that mm -hmm. does, you can see how that could multiply. Right. So um, moving on, I want to talk about housing court and we've, mm -hmm. another thing, very, <laughs> very much in, so impacted by the pandemic as well, where housing court was shut down mm -hmm. uh, due to, you know, not wanting to have people in person or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Uh, we've heard, you know, about the court being used as a tool when it was up and going as for how to deal with these housing issues. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you own a house or you live in a house and you see next door that someone's got a bunch of junk and debris and piled up in their backyard or front porch, you know, you would say, well, I'm gonna, you know, report that in. Mm -hmm. So, but during the pandemic, <laughs> it didn't matter if you did that. Sounds like, you know, but there's no court, there's no repercussions, so to say, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm speaking slightly off about that because I know there were ways that could it, it was dealt with, but Crystal, mm -hmm. how did the pandemic really affect that tool and thus affect housing and maybe is still affecting housing? Yeah, it, it, it definitely is still affecting housing. Um, even now, there's still a significant backlog. Um, during the pandemic, you know, essentially, and I think it, it's important to clarify code enforcement's role and authority um, even though we have enforcement actually in the title, right? Uh, we ultimately do not have the authority to uh, hold offenders accountable. Um, we can cite, uh, you know, we issue notices of violation for things like junk and debris, high grass, um, other issues that, that are, uh, you know, complaints are filed, but when it comes down to it, if, compliance is not achieved and we, are, we have to issue a notice of appearance or a ticket to appear in court. Um, when you don't have court, there's no one to appear before. There is no court. There is no, um, there is not that judicial, I guess, part of the process that actually holds people's uh, feet to the fire, if you will. Um, so there, there was severe, um, there was just such a lack of accountability and I'll say, you know, those who already have found ways to kind of get around the system mm -hmm. really took advantage of it. Um, so the, you know, the disinvestment, um, it, it blatant just neglect, you know, and it was sort of the attitude of, well, what, what are you going to do? I know that you don't have the authority to hold me accountable, so mm -hmm. I'm just not going to comply. Um, so it was very, you know, really challenging, really frustrating. Um, we're still, you know, kind of in that cycle of trying to not only catch up, um, but we still don't have access, you know, a full access to housing court. Um, currently, and, and it's not just housing court that, that really was delayed. So, you know, criminal court cases, civil court cases, eviction court, it was all impacted. Um, the housing court issue is, is really, you know, the, the biggest thing that we're dealing with. Um, and it, just the delay in all of that and then the backlog that we're still trying to work through, we only have housing court once a week currently. Mm. Uh, that's all that we're scheduled for. And um, we're only allowed 20 cases maximum. So, I, I, I mean, that's just... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's tough. Each, you, each of our code enforcement officers has approximately somewhere between 180 and 200 open cases at a time currently. Each. Each. And how many code enforcement officers do you currently? Three. Have? Three. So that means you have, I mean, if we say, even if we say 100 cases, that's still like 300 open cases at least, but well, definitely more like 500. Yeah, we're, we're closer to 600. Um, and there are a number of cases that we, you know, we sort of had to go through and say, okay, what are the most egregious? Which ones are going to be, you know, when, when court first opened back up, which ones do we need to get in front of the judge right away? Um, and so that's what we did, and that's what we continue to do is, is prioritize the most egregious cases. Um, unfortunately, that makes it difficult to bring in, you know, some of the junk and debris cases, the high grass cases, uh, and, and that's very frustrating for, you know, people who are filing complaints to feel like, well, why am I, why do I even bother to file a complaint if it's not being taken care of, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's important for people to know that um, when the complaint comes in, we work the case and 
our goal is always compliance. Um, and it's also important to note that we, we probably do have 75 to 80% of cases where people do voluntarily comply. Um, it's really just those, those more, like I said, the egregious cases that we end up having to escalate to, to housing court. Um, and when you're limited to 20 and you've got 600 that you're actively working, uh, it's, you know, it's very limited in, in what we can do. So is there, do you see any kind of solution to that? I, I think it's a combination of things. Um, and, you know, I think that trying to look at court as it, that's the end game, right? Like that's the last resort. Um, and we already look at it that way. We, we don't want to bring people into court. You know, that's, that's time and resources. Um, we would much rather have voluntary compliance. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at other ways to, it's kind of like um, uh, the auction, right? The auction is a last resort sort of tool. Um, so what other tools can we put together to make that last resort really a true last resort and not to have quite so many cases that we have to bring before a judge. Uh, so, you know, things like policy change. So we've got some ordinances that we're working through right now. Um, things like uh, a lot of our cases are, um, if people don't have the financial resources, right? So, you know, maybe we have to cite somebody because their porch needs repaired or they have steps that need to be repaired or maybe they have to paint. So trying to, when we do cite them, also work with them and try to find ways that we can help them. So maybe it's help them en enroll in one of the programs that we have or one of the programs one of our housing agency partners has. Um, or maybe it's we have several volunteer groups that we've been able to connect with over the last couple of years. Maybe it's reach out to one of them and they pull together a group of people that will go over and they'll paint a house or they'll they'll fix a porch. You know, we, we saw um, an example of that last summer, uh, a group of, of uh, a great group of people pulled together. Uh, some of them knew each other, some of the, them didn't, but they, they just started to reach out and um, they fixed a porch, they fixed a porch roof, they fixed a window, um, you know, of a, a, a couple over on Walnut Street yeah. who just didn't have the financial resources to do it. So, um, you know, we were able to, we, we had to cite them. Mm -hmm. They weren't happy about that. Um, but we, you know, that's our job. Um, but we were able to work with the community to pull together the human resources, if you will, um, and some of the financial resources through volunteers and donations. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, certainly not every case happens like that, but just trying to match each individual case with some kind of a solution. So we're not just, here you go, here's your notice of violation, good luck, right? That's, that's, that's not who we are as an organization and that's not, um, you know, that's, it, it doesn't actually provide real solutions to, to just kind of, um, you know, let them sort of figure it out on their own if they don't have the resources to do it, so. Right. And I, I, I remember last summer going out to that, that house on Walnut Street the day that everyone mm -hmm. was there, and it was quite yeah. quite an effort. And you know, the they were of grilling people, hot dogs gr and yes. hamburgers. <laughs> and it was it was you know a, a, like a big party, and, yeah. and I guess you could say like a, a barn raising all in one. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it was really it was something to see in, in yep. Jamestown. So uh, something you mentioned that there, I know these are not passed, I know they're still being worked mm -hmm. on, but can you talk about the, there's three ordinances mm -hmm. that you are looking at implementing, yep. and can you, and I know one is, it's a one with about, that you're working with a real estate investors association uh -huh. with, and that's, this is all very, very current as yeah. we're talking about it, uh, and I'm trying to remember that, is that the public nuisance ordinance? Well, that's the one that we've met on okay. so far. Oh, so so far. we'll work with them on all of them, um, because they do impact all of our landlords and mm -hmm. property owners um, who have investment properties, right? So, um, you know, we certainly want to work with them. So, you know, last week we met with the Real Estate Investors Association um, 
we only got through the public nuisance mm -hmm. uh, and that was really just a first pass. Um, and I was actually really encouraged that, you know, the meeting was great. Um, I know that, that the idea of passing new policy can be a little bit scary, um, but I think we realize that, that we absolutely need some policy changes. Um, the folks that we met with were very, provided some really great constructive um, feedback a lot of their uh, input was really clarifying. Um, you know, just needed some additional clarification on some things. So, um, you know, we'll do the same thing with the other two. We have a, a rental inspection ordinance and a vacant property registration ordinance. Um, and, you know, just kind of work through those things. And, and it's great to have uh, their willingness to participate in this process with us um, because we don't see things from their perspective. We could try. Uh, you know, we can, we, we think we might have all of the I's dotted and all of the T's crossed, but unless you're actually in it, it's, it's really difficult to, to get it all. So um, it was a really productive meeting and we're looking forward to the next couple of, of meetings as we, you know, finalize the, the nuisance um, ordinance and then work our way through the other two. Mm -hmm. Can you give an overview of the three? Ordinances that you're working on? Sure, sure, yeah. So the, the public nuisance ordinance, we, we already have a public nuisance ordinance. Um, what we found is that it's relatively subjective, um, which, you know, is not good for anyone. <laughs> um, we just felt like it needed to be a little bit more um, objective and to spell some, some things out a little bit more clearly. Uh, so, you know, that one is... Actually, of the three, that's probably the easiest one to kind of knock out. Um, and, you know, a public nuisance might be um, something where, uh, for instance, uh, a property where there's junk and debris, mm -hmm. say, we can't get it into court, we can't get a response from a property owner, maybe they're overseas, maybe they're whatever the case might be. Maybe they're deceased. That happens too. Mm. Um, legally, we don't have authority to mitigate an issue unless it's under a specific ordinance. Um, so it's only in extreme cases. And so that's really how we want to make sure that we use this ordinance is in the most extreme cases where there's threat to public health, there's threat to, to life and safety, um, that sort of thing, then we would be able to use this ordinance as a way to mitigate or abate a problem um, that otherwise, you know, we're not getting uh, any sort of resolution from the property owner on. Mm. Um, the other two, so the rental inspection ordinance is exactly like it sounds. Um, this ordinance proposes to, uh, at the time of a transfer, so a sale, transfer of a deed, um, that would trigger an inspection uh, for rental properties. So that would be a code enforcement um, inspector that would come and they would do the inspection. Uh, and it's really, you know, if you're, if you're a property owner and you're a landlord and you're doing all of the things you're supposed to be doing and maintaining your property, it's gonna be easy peasy. Um, it's the more, uh, you know, auction properties, for instance. Those ones are going to be the more substandard, the ones that maybe haven't had continuous investment over time that might have a, a bigger to-do list that would be um, kind of identified through that rental inspection process. Um, there will be a fee associated with the inspection, so per unit. Um, there's a lot of details. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with it, but you know, essentially it's a way to uh, incentivize landlords to continue to invest in their properties, to keep them maintained, um, and uh, also to give us the information that we need. So, um, you know, being able to have proper contact information and, and ways to get a hold of them should there be an emergency or we need to get a hold of them for whatever reason. Um, and it also will help us to uh, identify actual people versus an LLC, which is a non-person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have a number of LLCs that own properties in the city, um, and it, it's been difficult over the years to be able to just figure out who the person is to call. Um, so 
Yeah. Like a property manager or something. Yeah, and you know, they are required to list a property manager at the time of the auction, um, especially if they're not uh, a local uh, landlord, but uh, you know, they change. The property managers change, the tenants change, the, the landlord is, right, this non-entity that is based in California or based in Australia or based in Canada. Um, so just being able to have someone, so, you know, for those more egregious cases where we do need to bring them into court, we actually know who we're ticketing. Mm -hmm. um, so it will help us solve a lot of those issues. Um, and then the vacant property registry is exactly like it sounds. We have a number of vacant properties in the city um, and it's also a way to incentivize property owners and investors to not let properties sit empty. Um, you know, and when they sit empty, that's, that invites uh, unwanted um, activity sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it also, you know, really contributes to declining uh, property values and, um, you know, too many vacant properties is, is, for obvious reasons, not good for our tax base and not good for the city. So, um, you know, really providing uh, or decentivizing uh, property owners uh, who allow their properties to sit vacant. This will, this will provide us another tool. Okay. So thinking about vacant properties, mm -hmm. properties that have code violations, there is another program which we had the presentation that you and the Assistant Corporation mm -hmm. Council Ben Haskins provided to the Housing Committee yeah. on Community Matters that immediately preceded this program. And you discussed more details about the 19A Home Ownership Program and Gina, you're going to get a chance to talk again because, because <laughs> yeah, I, I promise, I promise I'd get back to you. Um, I want, I mean, if you can give a quick overview, what is this 19A home ownership program? And then Gina, I want you to talk about how, why it's different from what the land bank is doing, or maybe how it works hand in hand in it yeah. too. So yeah. Crystal, you go first. Yeah. So um, 19A is a real property, um, real property law provision that allows a municipality to take title to a vacant and abandoned property. So we have to go through a process of establishing or determining that the property not only is vacant, but it has also likely been abandoned. Um, and it also needs to be uh, unsecured. It has to be at least a year behind in taxes. And um, it may or may not be condemned, uh, but the unsecured part of that. So it's got to meet three of those tests. Um, the, the being behind in taxes is a mandatory one. Um, and, uh, and, and fortunately for us, it doesn't have to elevate to the, the three-year um, period like the, the tax auction. So you can act on it a bit quicker. Um, and it's, it's something that a municipality, a city, a town, a county can do. Um, so that's a really great tool that the state has provided us. We, um, I think a, a year and a half ago or so, uh, we, had a, a press conference oh. in front of a property that we actually yes over on Halleck. Uh it was on uh, oh. Catlin Catlin is yeah. well that so that neighborhood yeah. around there yeah um, and we said we're, we're you know we're, we're going to do this we're going to pursue 19 A's and so we we have pursued a, a number of them um, and throughout that process some of them fell off because you know a property owner either responded or a bank decided that they were going to take care of their property that was sitting empty, <laughs> whatever the case might be. Um, so we, we do have a number of 19A properties that we will be taking title to shortly. Um, it's in the final stages, just kind of waiting for the county to issue those, those titles, or uh, the state, I'm sorry. Um, and so what we'll do with that, uh, the 19A program um, will, uh, we see it as, as providing us with a number of different avenues. So I think each one will be a, maybe a little bit different. Uh, it's mm -hmm. going to depend on the property itself. It's gonna depend on the amount of rehab that it needs. Uh, some need more work than others. Um, some are, at, because they haven't sat vacant for quite as long as a, an auction property typically does, um, You know, they may need very little work done to them um, to be able to turn around and sell them. So. 
Um, we see it as a, a potential revenue stream for the city to continue to feed into the 19A program, to be able to continue to rehab these properties. Um, and it, it's also, we see it as an opportunity to create more home ownership. So we will look at um, sort of layering it with some of our other programs, uh, working really closely with the land bank, working with CRIC and COI, who have first time home buyer programs. Um, those programs assist uh, first time home buyers with establishing credit, uh, learning financial literacy, saving for closing costs and down payments. So once they've gone through that curriculum, we'll work with them and kind of use their, their graduates as a, our feeder. Um, because they'll be ideal candidates, they've already committed, they've shown that they're, um, you know, they've got some skin in the game. Mm, um, and so we'll, we'll continue to work with them and offer them opportunities to purchase these properties. Um, and then we'll be the mortgage holder. So for those, and oftentimes, and especially in this area, the traditional pathway to home ownership and a traditional mortgage is it's challenging and, and maybe even impossible. Um, I think that's part of the reason that we are now 51% rental in this area. Um, you know, people have a hard time crawling their way out of poverty and establishing credit and, you know, being able to, uh, to have that, that pathway to home ownership. So, um, you know, we see this as an opportunity to be able to help with that. Um, and through the program, the goal is, uh, Gina mentioned her home ownership, mm -hmm. um, the mentorship program. Right. So Which we're that looking was at new that. To me. Yeah, we're looking at that as, and I'll let you talk about that, mm -hmm. um, as an opportunity to con kind of continue that mentoring. And, you know, you've graduated from the first time homeowner. Um, program and you've got your closing costs, you've got your down payment, and now you've got your house, congratulations. But, you know, oftentimes to just let people go and say, well, okay, you're on your own, good luck, right? Mm -hmm. So this will, will kind of close that gap and, and continue to work with homeowners who, um, you know, need to save for the roof when it's time and need to, maybe they need to replace a furnace in a couple of years. So helping them figure out, you know, how are they going to financially um, make those plans to be able to do those kinds of things and just the regular upkeep and maintenance that happens or when do I need to call a plumber and how do I um, go to my municipality's website and look at what their codes are? Um, when do I need a permit? So all of those sorts of things that, um, you know, are just not necessarily common knowledge. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything to mm -hmm. that. Just, just uh, you know, we're looking forward to working with... Um, the people that are going through those home ownership or first time home buyer programs, mm -hmm. um, whether they're land bank houses or not. Um, we're hoping to partner with Habitat. We've been talking a little bit about um, looking at how they do counseling with their home buyers mm -hmm. um, and maybe getting some of their volunteers involved in this program to help us put curriculum together and, and hopefully help counsel. Uh, but we really do see it as a way that we can make those first time home buyers that much more successful for mm -hmm. the long term and make sure that they consistently have the support and the resource uh, knowledge of where to go if they have an issue and they have somebody at least for that first year that they know if I have a question or a problem or an issue I don't know how to handle, it's okay, I have a resource mm -hmm. I can call. And um, you know whether that person's helping them fix a leaky faucet that they've never dealt with before, in which case they can use our tools mm -hmm. to do that. We'll make our tools available through a lending library type mm -hmm. situation. Um, or if it's um, you know something happened and they got behind on a payment um, or taxes, uh, oh my God, what do I do? You know that person could be there to give them some guidance and some counseling on that. Or like uh, Crystal said, just putting together a property maintenance plan and a budget so that they can take that asset and maintain that asset over time mm -hmm. because you know your home is one of the biggest assets that you'll have to establish your 
economic prosperity into the future. So you want to protect that asset. And people that have never owned a home before don't necessarily know those types of things, um, especially if they're a first generation homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that we take for granted um, that they might not necessarily know on their own. So if we provide that mentorship, it takes them through that cycle of actually getting into their first home, but then understanding and maintaining that asset for the long term. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned uh, this mobile tool lending library. Is this something that's up and going right now? It's uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we don't have the lending part up and going. Uh, we've got the trailer, which you'll see around town during our hands-on events. Um, we bought the tools, or at least most of the tools right now. Uh, we've been debating how we're going to do the lending part, and we think that through this mentoring program that that's how we'll launch that, is um, you've got a mentor, you've got a home buyer, um, and we'll make the tools available through that program right now until we figure out the, the next phase of maybe making it a little more accessible. Uh, beyond that program. Mm -hmm. What kind of the to what kind of tools do you have? Mostly hand tools. <laughs> hand tools. Yeah, so. we're not gonna we're not gonna uh, lend out any chainsaws and uh, and uh, circular saws that that might get somebody injured if they don't know how to use well, them. Gosh but. darn it! I guess I won't be able to. <laughs> but ask we'll it have for some power. stuff. Yeah. We'll have a little bit of power <laughs> yeah. tools like blowers and and uh, uh, maybe you know. Uh, uh, skill saw, things like, you know, some of that stuff will have electronic drills, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's gonna be mostly hand tools and uh, some of your real basic power tools. Sure. Is this something that you've seen that is common where first time home buyers or first generation home buyers are moving into situations where they don't have these? Is this where mm -hmm. this kind of born, was born out of, this idea? Yeah, and you know, a lot of times when you're you know, hoping to buy your first home, you're so, so overwhelmed with the process, right? And, and actually having the structure to move into. And you might get a, excited about buying your furniture and the rugs and the appliances, but you don't think about, oh, shoot, I have a lawn I have to mow and I don't have a mower, yeah. you know, and, and things like that, you know, or they just might not really know what types of tools. Um, and that's, it's not for everybody. I mean, there's a lot of really handy people out there that, that get that, you know, and probably have the tools f for their apartment because a lot of times you're doing your own work there. But, uh, but we just want to make it that much simpler for somebody to be successful as a homeowner. Mm -hmm. What, with the 19A program, it sounds mm -hmm. like there, with the, that and the land bank are operating similarly, but they're different programs. What are, yeah. what, how are they different? Well, I think primarily the 19A program can only be um, initiated by, I believe, a municipality. Mm -hmm. um, although land banks have been very involved in that process uh, with some municipalities, and uh, we have one large land bank in the state uh, the Greater Mohawk Valley Land Bank, uh, which actually helped put a process together and a guidebook for municipalities to show them basically how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's an excellent tool in the toolbox, um, partially for what Crystal mentioned is the fact that you can you can turn the property around much quicker than waiting it for it to go to, through the tax cycle or the mm -hmm. foreclosure cycle. Um, so you can get in there maybe before the structure goes derelict. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it really augments the capacity of the land bank to step in and leverage programs with the city, with other agencies. Mm -hmm. um, our land bank works as closely as possible as we can with the other agencies in the area. Um, so we've done work with CRIC, with COI, with CODE, with Habitat. Um, mm -hmm. we, we're at a point, I think, in our society and in our economy where we have to leverage the programs that we have. And housing is such a huge issue, and we need all the tools in the tools box. The land bank's only one tool. Mm -hmm. We're not a panacea for, you know, everything housing. 
and uh, we have to work with our partners to make sure that we're covering bases, mm -hmm. um, not duplicating efforts where we can avoid it, but filling the gaps and, and making sure we're covering um, all of the issues out there. Uh, you know, poverty's increasing, um, unfortunately, in our county, and we can't, we can't address poverty until we address housing. Mm -hmm because they're so, they're so codependent on each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and housing is, is a very, very huge component mm -hmm. of the poverty problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you got to the heart of it where, you know, talking about working with other, other organizations about not wanting to duplicate, and that's what mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of make clear that there is a difference between mm -hmm. this, the 1980 program, the 1980 program, yeah. which is going on, and, and for our listeners may not know that you're looking at making it permanent, which is you have a funding request in the we city do. council, yeah. but the program is still able to go on. Sort well, I shouldn't say the rehabilitation efforts you want to do, mm -hmm. are why you're asking for the additional funding. Correct. Correct. Right. Yes, the the additional funding um, would help us establish a sustainable mechanism mm -hmm. um, to be able to continue rehabs. Uh, it also serves, it sort of serves as sort of a revolving loan fund. Right. Um, we will work with other agencies, um, you know, I guess to go back a little bit, right? We're creating these homeowners mm -hmm. and, and we're, we're getting people into homes that they may not have otherwise been able to afford or get a mortgage for but we also don't want to, to set them up for failure. So we want to be able to help them with the rehabs. Um, so, you know, whether it's a partnering with our home program or looking to CRIC or CODE or COI or the land bank for one of their other programs to make sure that we're match, you know, we're matching that homeowner with the right fit program. Um, but to establish a 19A program that will help us fund those rehabs, especially the, the ones that are a bit more costly. Um, and I'll, I will talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be able to know that we have a sustainable funding source that we can go to when the home funds have run out or that the CRIC doesn't have a program right now or COIs, you know, in the middle of applying for grants or whatever the case might be. Um, you know, our, our available funds kind of go, you know, we've got some peaks and valleys. So um, this will help us establish a program that is sustainable and um, always available to us to continue to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the, the more costly repairs. This is something that, um, you know, we talked about with council the other night. There are going to be times where the cost to rehab a house may be more than, um, what we'll be able to sell it for. You know, we may be taking a little bit of a hit. Um, I want to be really clear that these 19 A's uh, that we have pursued are strategic. Um, we, it's not, there's no willy nilly about it. Um, it is properties that are in neighborhoods that are either um, kind of at a, a tipping point. Mm -hmm. So by stabilizing one or two properties on a block, that could really help stabilize that entire neighborhood. Um, or, you know, it, it could be a commercial corridor where everything else around it is great and you've got this one just really blighted property that's bringing everything else down. Um, so it's really about neighborhood stabilization and you know that I think is first and foremost. Um, there's a strategy. Mm -hmm. So you know there may be times where we sell the property for less than what we have invested into it. But there are going to be other times where we sell, are able to sell the property and generate continued revenue, and that will go back into the program to to sustain it over time. I think it was a, a citizen who was at the, the work session who said, well, wouldn't mm -hmm. it just be cheaper to tear it down mm -hmm. than if it's such an yes. eyesore? And <laughs> no, the answer to that is no. Um, we're averaging, and it might actually even be higher now um, with the continued rising costs um, of everything, mm -hmm. every sort of construction-related um, you know, thing. So, you know, demolitions have, the cost of demolitions have skyrocketed. There's um, nine 
a and a half times out of ten, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a asbestos abatement mm -hmm. or lead abatement or or you know, um, that those costs. Then you've got to do air monitoring and. Um, you know, we were averaging about $33,000 per demolition. Um, and then you have a vacant lot. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you're never going to be able to get uh, the tax revenue that you would have generated mm -hmm. if that lot had a structure on it. I see. And I think with the way the program works, that if you do rehabilitate a house and mm -hmm. then sell it, then... So there's still a structure there, mm -hmm. and then there's someone paying taxes. Was was exactly. the other point you brought up? Yep, so. you're able to maximize that that tax revenue, which is right. It's 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 what we need. I mean, we we talk a lot about generating tax revenue, and that's what helps us provide services to our residents. That's what helps our parks departments take such good care of our parks. That's mm -hmm. you, you know we we need that tax revenue for everything that the city provides. So. Um, you know, and I'll just mention demolitions, it's a huge component of, of removing blight and neighborhood stabilization, but our strategy is not demolition first. Mm -hmm. It is, can it be rehabbed? What is the cost benefit to rehab versus demo? Mm -hmm. um, and so we really take that very seriously and make very, I would say, calculated decisions when it comes to demolition versus rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So we do have a, a couple questions that have come in, but we're gonna, okay. we have one more, one more thing that I want to sure. pose to you before we got to that. Um, in, in the recent months, we've talked a lot about new housing incentive programs, either proposed mm -hmm. or ones that have gone through because of mm -hmm. the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, like you've said, these before the ARPA funds came on, you were doing Mm -hmm. home improvement programs before that. So what are some of the yeah. services that are, are available right now for folks sure. in, in Jamestown? If in, and Gina, if you have anything you want to chime in with mm -hmm. too, from either your site or county, why they, I mean, I welcome that too. So. Sure. Um, so the city is uh, an entitlement community um, designated by HUD. So we receive an annual allocation of home investment partnership funding every single year. Um, we have a number of properties that we are working on rehabilitating right now, and um, that ha that program is specifically for homeowner occupied properties. It is an income eligible program, um, but most of the people in our community are eligible. Um, so that program is open um, if someone is looking for assistance with home rehab. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of criteria, there's a lot of um, commitment that goes with it. It's a, it's a big program. We look at your entire house and we inspect from top to bottom um, and we have to make it code compliant. So if there's, you know, anything that's not code compliant for whatever reason has to be addressed. Um, but it's a great program and, you know, it, it can be a long program um, just because contractors are, are hard to come by. Um, and it takes a long time to kind of go through that entire house from top to bottom. But um, by the time we're done, you know you, your house is safe, you know it's, it's code compliant, and you know that um, you're going to be able to be there for a long time after that. Um, so that's our home investment partnership program. Uh, we will have a rental rehabilitation program coming out, um, hoping sometime in August, still waiting on some HUD approval. but. Um, that will be for uh, landlords, obviously. Uh, it's a $15,000 per unit um, allocation that, that landlords are eligible to apply for. Um, they had, do have a 10% matching requirement for that. Um, so once that's available, we'll make an announcement and, and um, share all of the specific details about that. Um, and then we have uh, our uh, American Rescue Plan programs. We did, um, this program is closed now, but we had the roof, sewer lateral, and water line replacement program. Um, very, uh, very high demand, <laughs> lot of applications. So um, we are hoping that we will be able to um, add additional funding into that program. So uh, initially there was uh, $750,000 allocated. That's only enough for 30 
projects. Um, money goes fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had 130 applicants. So we are hoping that we will be able to fund uh, the remainder of those because almost every single uh, application was eligible. There are mm -hmm. very few that were not. Um, and then we also have, uh, uh, and I'll tell you where to find the details on this because they're, these are not my program specifically. Um, there's a senior citizen rebate program. So if you uh, have home improvements that you are doing on your property or you're planning to do on your property, um, you can uh, find on the city's website or call the assessor's office or stop into the assessor's office, uh, especially if you have questions. Um, and uh, you might be eligible to receive a rebate uh, for any home improvements that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there will be uh, another one similar, but it won't be limited to seniors. That will also be a rebate type program. Mm -hmm. And I believe those two that are in assessor's office mm -hmm. are currently open right now. And I think until at least the senior citizens one I know is open till August 15th. Yeah. So. Uh, it's one of those things where, unfortunately, by the time it, this program is going to re-air again next next week Thursday, yeah. so I think that program will be closed. But yeah. it is open at this point in time if you are listening and interested. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, the website for the city, um, Jamestown NY dot G O V. Okay. <laughs> so all right. Um, I, because I we have a couple questions coming in, I don't mm -hmm. want to like skip over that. So. Uh, one of the first questions that we have is, what strategies have other communities used to improve quality of housing or at least stop decline? I'm like, I don't know, Gina, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with anything maybe happening in Erie County or elsewhere that isn't happening here maybe? I think a lot of us follow the same types of strategies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if you're in the, the, the planning um, industry, if you're in city government, you're in land banking, mm -hmm. you know, we all talk mm -hmm. <laughs> and we collaborate and brainstorm on stuff. So if there's a new idea, it's disseminated pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of anything really unique off the top of my head that that we haven't tried or, or aren't doing right now. The 19A um, uh, program has been fairly new mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of communities doing it. Jamestown's one of the most successful um, in the state, I would say. I, so. I think that that would be um, honest is mm -hmm. to say that it's probably one of the, the most successful programs that I've seen in the state using 19A. Um, you know, this, there were resources that were rolled out with regards to zombie properties, which people may be familiar with that okay. term. Yes. Um, but just to clarify, a zombie is a, is a home that's uh, vacant and is somewhere in the bank foreclosure mm -hmm. process, but hasn't been actually foreclosed on. Yeah. And a lot of times, because there's such a problem with securitized mortgages and uh, mortgage servicing companies where mortgage titles are, you know, the paper is just traded between financial hmm. institutions um, and investment groups. Sometimes a bank doesn't even know what they own. And so it can fall through the, through the cracks and just sit there vacant and abandoned. And the state recognized that specifically after the housing crisis of 2008 and they put some resources in place so that uh, so that municipalities could start to understand who owns the zombies, how do we reach out to them, and how do we uh, resolve the issue and get this uh, property uh, turned around. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that may be the mm -hmm. funding that helped start um, the use of an attorney in the development mm -hmm. department to handle primarily zombies in 19As mm -hmm. uh, was through that funding process. And uh, land banks in, in many areas have been able to kind of ride the coattails of the municipal uh, funding for zombies to help leverage our programs and make sure that we're working at least strategically in collaboration with each other mm -hmm. on types of things like that. So that's really kind of cool. Um, I know that receivership is something that we're talking about mm -hmm. through the state that you don't see a whole lot, but Crystal can talk a little bit more to 
um, how that's being used in Buffalo mm -hmm. and you know how um, we're exploring that as a possibility mm -hmm. um, in the county. Um, but I would say a lot of the um, a lot of the creative solutions to housing issues um, really come out of grassroots efforts or um, strategies in really desperate towns and cities across the nation mm -hmm. uh, who decide we have nothing to lose, let's mm -hmm. try this. Yep. And you know, you see land banking coming out of you know the Detroits of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, Cuyahoga County was one of the biggest first um, successful land banks. Uh, Detroit, obviously, with their issues there, and in Flint, um, they've done some of the most creative programming that we've seen in housing. Um, Philadelphia has some real unique programming. So um, I can't point to anything particular, and I'm sorry I'm rambling. That's um, okay. But, uh, but there's some really neat stuff out there, and we always try to benchmark what we're doing against the most successful mm -hmm. programs and the best practices that we can find. Yeah, you mentioned receivership, and I'm not familiar with what that is. And you said, Chris, Crystal, you have some more information. About yeah, what it's it's something that we are uh, looking at, and um, we've already had some initial discussion with council, um, and you know we've been talking about it with with Gina at the land bank, and um, it's it already exists. It's something that can happen right now. Um, a, if there's a property that has just been kind of a, a constant nuisance and a, and there's disinvestment and there's somebody living in the property, a judge can actually appoint a receiver. So it could be an attorney. Um, the individual or agency has to be certified to be a receiver, so there is a certification process. Um, the city of Buffalo actually just uh, appointed Preservation Buffalo Niagara as a receiver. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it does is, is in those really extreme cases, the judge will actually appoint that receiver to um, collect rents. So no oh. income is going directly to the property owner for a period of time. They make the necessary repairs on the property. And then once they have either been fully reimbursed or um, the property owner decides to walk away or they decide to sign the property over. Um, you know, there, I think there's a number of different things that could happen, but um, essentially it's meant to hold that property owner accountable, make the necessary repairs, keep the property habitable and occupiable, uh, safe, um, and, and, you know, provide that um, kind of intervention, I guess, is that's needed. So we're looking at it um, as a tool similar to what Buffalo has done. Um, I think, you know, trying to find the right agency or the right receiver um, will be a key. Uh, and, you know, we're, it's definitely something that we're exploring. Okay. I think I do recall Mayor Sunquist re mm -hmm. referring to that at some point, and I don't recall in what meeting. It happens yeah. when you go, I go to a lot of city council meetings as yeah. well. So um, just this is probably a, a short answer based mm -hmm. on what I've discussed with you before, Crystal. But one of the other questions is, would the city consider extending the senior citizen assistance program filing deadline if some, some of the senior homeowners still haven't gotten a contractor to get an estimate by the August 15 deadline. And we are, we, we have like less than a minute, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I think we certainly will consider anything, right? Um, I, I can't answer it for the assessor's office. It's, it's not my program. Um, I think it could be a, potentially a, a question for city council. Um, I know there's been a lot of demand for the program, so I, I think it's entirely possible that um, the deadline could be extended. Um, I know that finding contractors is really difficult. Uh, we are experiencing that ourselves and trying to get some of our programs done. So um, I won't say, 
I can't say that, yes, there's a guarantee that that could happen, but I think it certainly is a possibility. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on for this yeah. month's program and, and participating again. And also thank you to our audience who has tuned in. You'll be able to view this presentation again online for free on our Facebook page and YouTube channel and on WRFALP.com. We'll have that audio uh, uploaded as well. On behalf of WRFA, the Rush Lene Center for the Arts team and Cranky Plate Productions, thank you for being with us here tonight.